Okay. So, um, as Grant said, I'm going to be talking about PDT. Um, so it's a pretty big topic. And so what I was going to do today is just go over an introduction to what PDT is and then talk about one specific um, newer treatment um, on the horizons for PDT in uh, choroidal metastatic disease. So I figured I would always start with uh, some early morning humor. So this is some different opinions about uh, what grand rounds might mean, some different people. And, uh, and on the other side, the Arnold to feign death. And I hope none of you feign death uh, to get out of my presentation here. So, <laughs> All right, so what is PDT? Um, so in ophthalmology, we use vertiporfin. There are different kinds of um, molecules that are used, but vertiporfin is most applicable to ophthalmology. And there are some other kinds too, but this is definitely the most mainstream. So it's referred to as a photosensitizer. And I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So basically, um, the photosensitizer is injected into the, the venous system, and then some time is allowed to pass, and then light is applied um, intraocularly, um, or actually to any area of the body where you can apply light and it activates the substance or the vertiporfin um, at the specific wavelength and at the very specific location of the light. So in for vertiporfin, it's maximal activations at 689 nanometers. So um, that's where you'll see that exact laser, the diode laser being applied to um, activate vertiporfin. And what's really great about it is that exactly where the light is directed is the only place where the um, vertiporfin is activated. So it's really great for targeting um, all sorts of localized pathology. So you can kind of imagine that would be pretty applicable to ocular conditions. So the 90s is when they started studying it in ocular conditions and they looked at it in um, some monkey studies um, because it was showing great promise for um, neovascular tissue, that it was able to specifically target neovascular tissue. So um, they found in those early studies that it was really minimally disruptive to the surrounding environment, like the overlying um, uh, retinal vessels or the choroidal vessels underneath. So uh, after that point, there was a formation of something called the TAP study group, and that was uh, directed at age-related macular degeneration. And that was a series of multiple studies which had really served as the pioneer for PDT. Um, and they really set the standards as, as to how we use PDT today. And it led to FDA approval for um, CNV secondary to AMD, pathologic myopia, and presumed ocular um, histoplasmosis syndrome. Um, so how is it performed specifically? So I just wanted to show you kind of there, there's a very specific regimen. But what's interesting about um, the way that it's performed is that this is the original protocol that was set out by the TAP um, researchers, but lots of, re of people recently have been varying this protocol and looking at how that might change outcomes um, and how things like concentration inside of the tumor are affected by a bolus infusion versus over 10 minutes. So they, they've actually adjusted almost every parameter on this list here, um, and they've had interesting results in various kinds of ocular pathology. So here's a list of tumors that it's used to treat um, in the int I intraocular tumors. So today I'm just going to be talking about choroidal metastatic disease, but you can see there's um, quite a few others that it's been studied in, and especially with um, a large degree of success with the choroidal hemangiomas. So just briefly wanted to touch on um, choroidal metastatic disease. So the uveal tract is the most common site for um, ocular malignant adult cancer. And it's thought to be because of the microenvironment and also because of the highly vascular nature of the um, uveal tract. Specifically, the choroid comprises the vast majority of um, the, the metastatic disease. Um, the rest of the uveal tract is just a tiny percentage. And the vast majority of uh, metastatic disease to the uveal tract is going to come from breast and lung adenocarcinoma. In fact, it's somewhere between 2 and 9 percent of all breast and lung uh, adenocarcinoma that's going to metastasize to the uveal tract. And actually within that, it's more breast cancer because it has better prognosis and longer survival, better treatments, so more people are presenting with um, metastatic disease at this time, whereas lung, lung adenocarcinoma has um, poor outcomes. 
But even so, upon presentation um, with choroidal metastatic disease, the median life expectancy is between six and nine months. So what we're really talking about here in this application of photodynamic therapy is palliative care and vision sparing care so that somebody doesn't have to go through loss of vision on top of um, having a very poor prognosis at the end of their life. Um, so clinically, what you'd be looking for is sudden vision change, blurred vision, scotoma, and pain. <coughs> and I'm specifically highlighting pain here, <coughs> excuse me, because pain is not necessarily a feature of other malignant ocular tumors. So um, whereas in metastatic disease, a moderate amount of patients present with pain as a chief complaint. But the vast majority actually present in the asymptomatic state. So this would be a patient who presents with a history of malignancy who's then coming in for screening, who's found to have an asymptomatic lesion. But once these lesions are found, clinically they are very rapidly progressive. And um, they're aggressive, they lead to serious retinal detachments, and they can involve the maculum fovea and involve central vision quickly. Um, so you can see on exam here, um, the flat, they can either be flat or plateau um, in shape, and um, you can see the cream colored versus yellow um, on the, in the lesions here, and then some element of uh, serious retinal detachment on the, right, on the uh, left side of the picture. Um, so why is PDT, why, why has PDT been considered for treatment of choroidal meds? Um, so basically the gold standard or the most common treatment modality used is external beam um, radiotherapy. But as you can imagine, there might be some patients who aren't eligible for that. And there have been documented cases of patients who have chemotherapy resistant cancers. So they wouldn't be eligible for um, further chemotherapy to treat ocular metastasis. And you know, uh, people uh, who aren't eligible for external beam radiotherapy might be individuals who um, are at high risk for uh, post-radiation retinopathy or post-radiation neuropathy. So in, in individual, like individuals such as those, um, they have looked into other means, and that's when PDT kind of came onto the horizons. And it's really, um, it's, it has favorable use because its side effects are really minimal. Most of its side effects just comprise skin sensitivity and eyesight uh, sensitivity to light. So um, for about six weeks after therapy. So it's a, it's a pretty benign treatment. Um, so here's just some reports of, there's actually only been four cases in the literature that have been described as of right now for um, choroidal metastasis with PDT treatment. And they've been in two lung, one, excuse me, one lung, two breast, and one uh, carcinoid that, that were metastatic to the choroid. And there was a uh, very nice common theme between all four studies showing tumor regression um, or stabilization and resolution of the uh, serious or exudative detachments, improvement in vision, and then a very n uh, dramatic decrease in neovascularization. But certainly one of the biggest limitations, as I kind of already stated, is going to be follow-up. Since we already know the median survival is so low, it's so hard to study this in people um, who have this advanced disease who aren't going to be around for follow-up to really see what happens to these lesions. Um, so I just wanted to end with a few pictures here. Um, so up top, the fundus photo is showing, again, that choroidal lesion. Here's fluorescent angiography, and you can see some pinpoint leaking. Um, and then you have a B-mode ultrasound where you can actually see the thickening of the choroid and then the um, increased uh, or the irregular um, reflectivity um, beneath. And then this is a uh, endocyanin green uh, angiography showing the neovascularization there in the um, pre-op state. And then I wish this OCT was a little bit better because you can kind of make out the line there showing the tumor um, underneath number one, and then there's an element of serious detachment. So um, post-op, you know, so this is six months and we're talking about a very aggressive lesion. So this is approximately the same size. Um, it certainly hasn't disappeared, but its margins haven't increased, um, and it certainly looks a lot cleaner as far as um, exudates go. But this one, I think, is um, really tells a lot about you can absolutely see this in comparison to the other B-mode ultrasound, um, the flattening of the lesion. And then again here on OCT, you can see, again, a pretty dramatic reduction in the lesion size and resolution of the serous detachment. And probably the most dramatic of all is the decrease in neovascularization seen on ICGA. 
So this is just um, another study. This was a, a breast cancer that was metastatic. And again, look at the dramatic changes between um, the, the pre-procedure and post-procedure states um, with quite a bit of leakage seen on fluorescein and um, a dramatic reduction in post-op and then um, probably subretinal or near RPE and um, intraretinal um, fluid accumulation and then resolution and, and restoration of the fovea um, architecture after. And then this is just showing um, very dense macular thickening um, right there. And then post-procedure, it's returned to a, a thinner level. So. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give a brief introduction to this, and I think I'm probably out of time. So um, these are my references, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you. So there has been, um, from what from what I've read, actually m s more studies <coughs> recently combining therapies. I so nothing on um, colloidal metastatic disease, but in the setting of the diffuse um, and the intraocular looking wounds and the immobilizer accumulation, at least one recent study has shown that it was effective to combine and reduce the risk group together. So they actually might play for play together in the same team. So our next presenter, actually I think it's Ed, right, Ed Stevenson. Um, Ed is originally from Ogden and uh, is currently in school at the Midwestern University in Arizona. Um, and he'll be uh, talking this morning about um, optic atrophy. Not chemokine. <laughs> 